know the events that are coming up. Okay. Okay, perfect. So we are live. Um, I'm gonna give just a couple minutes for people to start joining in before we officially start. But thank you all for joining us for our Palestine Monday series for June. Um, we're very excited. Again, I'm just gonna give a couple minutes as people join, make sure the live is working well for everyone. Um, I want to remind everyone as you're, as people are coming in and joining us, um, this is meant to be a moderated discussion and we, we really want to prioritize like audience Q&A and, and people's questions also. Um, so at any point, please feel free to put comments on Facebook or on YouTube and we will make sure um, to get to them. Um, so I am going to just get us started. I see that some folks are on. Um, on behalf of PAC, um, I want to thank everyone for joining, and I especially want to thank Dr. Abub for just our initial conversation and the way that this event organically came together just from us talking. Um, and we really appreciate you um, reaching out and wanting to, you know, host an event with us at PAC in our center. Um, so today's focus is really, as the title and the flyer shows, um, is to talk about the role of women and specifically decolonial feminism in the fight for Palestine. We want to, you know, honor and make sure that the role of women in the fight for Palestine is celebrated and is made known because it is a very um, significant role that has been played and isn't often magnified. So that's the point of this event. Um, we're going to talk about current day versus present day and how all of that connects. Um, and then talk about hopefully an end with some of the unique struggles that women face in the movement and perhaps discuss ways um, that we can combat that. And this is where we really want to encourage, again, audience, um, people who are tuning in to put their questions, whether you're on Facebook or on YouTube, on the comment or in the chat, and we, we will get to it towards the end. So I have some questions that I've prepared, just so everyone knows the order for today. Um, and I'm going to start off with a couple of those questions, and then I'll and then we'll get into any co audience questions or comments in the chat, and then we'll end it um, with some more questions that I've pre prepared from there. Um, so please, we want this as conversational as possible. So I really just want to again um, stress, we really want to hear your comments and your questions, and take advantage of this moment here in this virtual space. Um, it's my honor to go ahead and get us started and introduce. Dr. Rabab Abdelhadi, who is an internationally known scholar and distinguished professor and researcher who continuously supports community development and student engagement alongside her extensive academic work and publication and teaching schedule. Um, she is currently the, she's a founding director and senior scholar in the Arab and Muslim ethnicities and diasporas. Um, um, Wow, I totally just butchered that. And studies at San Francisco State University. Before joining SFSU, she served as the first director of the Center of Arab American Studies at the University of Michigan Dearborn. She's a policy advisor for Ashabaka, the Palestinian independent think tank, and serves on the International Advisory Board of World Congress of Middle East Studies, where she chairs this international committee. So again, we're very honored and happy to have you join us. Um, the floor is yours before I start this off with our questions. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Abir, and I'm really, really happy to be here with PAC. I want to, first first, or, first order is to start to say that San Francisco State University sits on a stolen indigenous Aloni people's land, and that's really important to acknowledge, and I believe the East Coast sits on the Lenape people's land, so we really need to acknowledge that and understand that in general, as a matter of principle, and also in terms of talking about Palestine and talking about uh, settler colonialism, indigeneity, and the right of people of the land to defend themselves, to speak up for themselves, to resist, to actually refuse the erasure of their narratives, of their struggle, of their history, and of their right to freedom, um, e equality, dignity, peace, and justice for all. Uh, that's first. Secondly, I really want, I'm so happy to be with you at PAC, and uh, I uh, I was horrified uh, to see the, the, the racist calls that you've received right after you came back from the holiday weekend. And we can talk about them because they're actually very relevant to our uh, topic. And for me, I'm actually hearing them. It reminded me a lot of uh, the voicemails I've received of the racist uh, emails about me and about other people, racist, orientalist, and Islamophobic. So I think it's really, really important for us to come together to both analyze, critique, and understand what is this, what's going on, to be able to actually talk about it, discuss it among ourselves and with our supporters and also with our detractors, so maybe they can learn something. That's what we're saying. People, 
knowledge is power, and we would really like to actually educate everybody uh, and see if they, they, may, may, they might actually like think about being reasonable enough. Maybe they won't, but we will try, right? And so I think that this is something that is very wrong. So I'm, I really salute your resilience, your, uh, your steadfastness, your power, your resistance, and also the calm with which the people who answered the calls were. I saw and I repeated, I watched it again and again and again. And, I'm, my, and, and, um, and it, so I think it's something that has to do with also the training and with the conditioning, because this is not something you're born with. And it's also, it has to do with going against the grain of actually, um, what is it that is required? of us, and I'm talking about Palestinian, Arab, Muslim, women of color, third world women, men, women and people, not only from marginalized communities, that you're constantly having to even watch how you're responding, how you answer. You can't actually lose your cool. You cannot, not because it's not right, because emotionality and reaction is a, is a human thing. But when, when, and this relates to our topic, when, when marginalized communities uh, speak, say something, they are constructed as unreasonable, uh, irrational, uh, too emotional, uh, not, uh, not, not sufficiently being calm and reserved and so on. And so they are constructed as the crazy people out there because they are responding out of a visceral. So I, I, I'm, 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 I'm in awe of the ways in which you've responded and which you picked up and you continue going. And I think this is very much connected to what we're talking about. So, Really, thank you for hosting me, and thank you for all your courage and power and, and resistance and resilience. Thank you. Well, we appreciate that. And on a personal level, yeah, a lot of that has been inspired by your work and and, watch, and just reading a lot of the work that you do. And I do want to give a huge shout out to all our staff, um, especially our office manager, who handled a lot of the phone calls much better than the rest of us. Um, but And I think this takes us you know perfectly into this conversation and what we what inspired this right and when you know our conversation when all of that that we said it first happened of um there's very much um extreme misogynistic tones in the threats that he made right and that came out right away the minute that you know he probably heard that we were women right or like knowing that so our our staff our core staff um is is made up of all women and so and this is what you know we've been thinking about this before and and we were having conversations about the role of women in the movement, right? Fighting the the patriarchy within, you know, the struggle to liberate Palestine, right? And this kind of double, um, this double struggle that, you know, I don't know how else to term it that we face. And so this is, this, I would mm -hmm. like us to, to take us into our first conversation or question about the connections between gendered violence and occupation. Um, and I was thinking and referring specifically to your piece about gender resistance and liberation in the 1960s Palestine living under occupation. Um, and that made me think of a paper that I once wrote. Um, I think it was the first one of the first papers I did in grad school, taught, you know, calling what I called the unique struggle that Arab and Muslim women have to face, which is a double interconnected subjugation. The first being the colonial chauvinism, um, and the second being a pre-existing patriarchy that was exacerbated by the first one. And so, do you see these as interconnected? And how do you? Um, and maybe if you can just talk a little bit more about that piece and that article and what these connections between gendered violence and occupation are. Yes, definitely. I mean, uh, let me, um, I would I would actually think, I would love to read your piece, number one. I always love to read uh, pieces by uh, emergent, what we say, emergent scholars. We don't want to say junior, or because it's, it, it set up a certain hierarchy, senior and junior, but by emergent scholars. And there's a lot of the stuff that gets written out there that we actually don't know about. And part of it is because we're also busy organizing, not only actually writing and theorizing and so on. And also there is something about kind of like, if you come from a marginalized community and this is what you're speaking about, also even the whole um, courage to write and, um, and, and I'm saying courage, I'm not talking about it as sort of like you're courageous, patting you on the back or something, because I think that's very patronizing and condescending. I am talking about uh, the, 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 the standing up against privilege and actually saying as, as a woman of color, as a Palestinian, as an Arab, as a Muslim, as a person from marginalized communities, you're constantly told that what the knowledge you produce is not worthy. And, and the, more, the more kind of like you lie at, the, let's say, the intersections of uh, power and, and privilege and so on, the less you feel that you're able to do, the less you're made to feel not you necessarily feel, you're made to feel that what you produce is not worthy 
And then also uh, the ways in which those people who are in pr more privileged positions, and I'm not talking about individuals, I'm talking about structures, feel that they can actually say anything they want, which is just like your caller. And I, maybe we can actually deconstruct some of the some of the stuff that's going on that becomes actually like, okay, this is where it's coming from. We've seen this, but what does this really mean? But in my and 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 in in the piece that I wrote about, actually, what I did is, this was about this was the 60s. Everybody was talking about not the 60s, but the commemoration of the 60s. Everybody, 40 years, 50 years, the long the, the, uh, decade of the 60s, and what happened, and there was a lot of discussion in North America and around the world about what happened in the 60s, and a lot of discussion was about what happened in the U.S. In particular, we talk about 1968. One of the major events was this, the, the, the longest student strike in the history of the U.S., led by the Black Student Union, Third World Liberation Front, at my own campus, San Francisco State University. And it was resilient. It asked for decolonizing the curriculum. But also, but a lot of the discussion had, was at that time a lot about what happened at Columbia University and what happened at, uh, at uh, Berkeley of the free speech and so on. And it was very interesting because there was also hierarchy of knowledge. So the, 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 the black and indigenous and other students of color and third world students and the, the allies at San Francisco State doesn't really get told that story because the stories of sort of like the more hierarchy of knowledge. At the same time, also the stories of what happened in Tunisia in 1968 also get eclipsed. What happened at the University of Mexico get eclipsed. What happened in Palestine? So one of the things that I was trying to do, I was invited to speak to several conferences. So one of the conferences was actually on the anniversary of the 67 occupation. And people were citing Fanon left and right. They were talking about what happened in the 60s. But it's sort of like taking Fanon out of the context that he was writing about Algeria. He was actually writing about the liberation struggle in Algeria. And so I started talking about what was going on in Palestine. And I used some of the, my experiences growing up under occupation. I was 12 years old when 1967 occupation took place. And I experienced this. I had already as a Palestinian growing up in Palestine, I had experienced the stories about Nakba, about displacement, about all of this, which we can talk about the role of the, the, the repression as well as the role. But also I was speaking about what the, in my analysis of Algeria, I was also talking about what I said, Jamilat Nablus. And they weren't all from Nablus, but I do remember one day, Everybody was saying this and so got arrested, this, so and so got arrested, Banat in Nabilsi, Nabilsi, uh, the, uh, women, young women were, were arrested. Maryam uh, Shashir, Amal Hambali. But then people were starting to talk about Rasmiya Ode, Aisha Ode. All these women were arrested. Later on, I, of course, I came to learn that there was the first Palestinian woman prisoner was Fatima Bernawi, who was actually from the Afro-Palestinian community in Jerusalem. Her father was from Africa. And she talks about, she was she was double refugee. And she speaks about what happened to her. And she actually, she passed away. But I actually had an exclusive interview with her in 1998 during my, my field research for my, and it's it's beautiful because she's talking about all sorts of things and I've translated it. And so it's kind of like ready to go. But also, so there were also the whole struggle of the women themselves and the way they have were repressed in prison. So one of the things was sort of your haram, young women who are being arrested now, they are at the prime of their life many of them. And then, so that, there's all this arrest and we're hearing about some of the torture. It's not actually widespread yet. And the sexual torture was not widespread yet. It was later on, I mean, we heard rumors when I was growing up, but it was sort of among, within the women's community, within, within the Palestinian community and so on. It wasn't really spoken about a lot until many Palestinian women actually were courageous to come out and say, part of the torture was also sexual torture. So part of the torture was, was carried out on our own bodies and the ways in which, and this is where the colonial violence actually interacts with pre-existing social hierarchies. So the, the colonial powers in Palestine, as in, in Algeria, for example, they were relying, thinking about, okay, if we're going to target the women about quote unquote, the question of honor, about the question of their social behavior, their standing and so on, they might actually, we can confess, and or become collaborators, which is something that they have done many times and actually during the Intifada of the Stone, 1987, what people called the first Intifada, there was a very widespread phenomenon called Scott. Scott meaning making one fallen. 
and Israel was using it in order to recruit more collaborators by, for instance, drugging women when they're going to a hair salon or where some places they're taking pictures of them, compromising and then threatening them that we will put the pictures out. And I actually heard about it when I was doing my research with Palestinian women in Gaza. I was like, this collective interview, there wasn't enough time. So somebody suggested, do you want to meet with everybody? I said, okay. So we had like, I don't know, maybe 18, 20 women from different groups in Gaza meeting. This was in 1993, actually. And then everybody starts talking about, and one woman says, don't drink RC. And I said, what do you mean don't drink RC? Don't drink RC because RC is the, is the brand of Coke in Gaza. That because, you know, people boycott Coca-Cola. So there was a, a local. And I said, what do you mean by that? And she said, even if you're going to your brother's house, if you're going anywhere, say I'm not drinking RC and I'm fasting to make up for the days I missed in Ramadan. Nobody is going to ask you as a woman, what was going on in Ramadan? Why did you miss? Because you're going to talk about menstruation and things that might be considered aib. So nobody was talking about it, like shameful. So they would say, no, don't drink anywhere. Be very careful about it. And the women were actually reinforcing each other. Later on, I actually learned when I, I interacted more with al Quds, the Palestinian uh, queer group, Aswat, and so on, that Israel actually was doing the same thing with queer, queer Palestinians, trying to extort them over gender and sexual issues in order to recruit them for to become informers. Now, the, why this is really interesting, the two issues are interesting, the sexual torture and the question of inform, because the colonial powers rely on what they think is existing hierarchies, which some of them do exist in, in our society, as well as all societies, in order to feel that this is a point of weakness, that they can come in and they can recruit. The other aspect of it is that they also, because they're colonial, and this is what also what happened to all of you at, at PAC, is that they assume that because you're a woman, you're not supposed to be involved in the, in the struggle. They we're told that, how, stu how stupid are you? Why would you even want to participate? You're going to be just getting sent to the kitchen. Don't even participate. As if women participate only for opportunistic reasons, only to gain well, as if they're not part of the population, they're not part of the Palestinian people, they're not also as oppressed as everybody else, like everywhere else. I mean, this is the same question. And I always say, why do you ask why women participate? How come you don't ask why men participate? I mean, why, why is the question, why is there even a question about women's participation? And this in itself, actually a very colonial, orientalist perspective that comes from colonial feminism and colonial discourses that the other aspect of it is that they also expect there is this whole notion that our society is so ex extraordinarily, exceptionally racist, exceptionally sexist, exceptionally homophobic, and so on. So then they're going to try to recruit some members of the society because they want to save brown people from brown communities. So then when people come up and speak out and say, this is not true, we're going to speak about the sexual torture and the ways, the resistance that takes place, that, for example, Rasmiya Ode spoke about, there is a book actually um, that was produced by a group in England called Minority Rights Group, so called talk, making women talk, and actually speaks about the experience of Fatma Abu Bakr in Gaza, who uh, he talks about step by step about what happened to her when the interrogators came in, and then when they started like taking off her clothes and when they started trying to touch her, and so on. She's actually saying, "I consider this torture part of torture." So in a way, I am not thinking about it as an exception, even though it's exceptional, even though the sexual torture is being used specifically and particularly about women, but also they were threatening women. We're going to go castrate your husbands and, and sons. We're going to rape you. We're, I mean, and they've done it. It's not like they haven't done it. The, the, the power of actually speaking up, and I'm not saying everybody has to speak up because not everybody feels that they need to speak up or need to come out, or that's okay. But I'm saying the fact that actually exposes this uh, perspective. Then the other aspect of it is, is the resistance of it, is that the colonial powers expect Women, for example, not to participate, not to resist, and then women resist. And this takes us to the article. The, the focus of the article was partly about the Jamilat and also partly about Leila Khalid, in the sense that if Leila Khalid did not dress, and people might know the story of Leila Khalid, did not wear those sort of quote unquote fashionable uh, Parisian clothing and so on, and when she wasn't the woman, she didn't, she pr might not have been able to get away of getting on the plane. But then the people who wrote, I mean, my, my general purpose was actually the way she was constructed in multiple stories about her, refer references to her body, to her beauty or no beauty, 
reference to her this plastic surgeries she made, reference sometimes uh, to her being childlike, which we actually see a lot in description of many indigenous women. There is a book about Rigoberta Manchu, and the person who's writing about her, who's actually supportive, says, oh, she was childlike making tortilla. I mean, like, why isn't? Why does a woman have to be, quote, unquote, innocent child and childlike, not to be an adult, not to be presented as an adult, for her to be able to actually participate? Why does he have, why does she have to be reduced to kind of like somebody who cannot speak for themselves in order for her to be palatable by, quote, unquote, mainstream discourses? Then the other thing is that, oh, she, she speak in the, in, in even the, the, the documentary that was made about her by a Palestinian woman, it was also kind of like, what did you, you didn't speak. People would say, oh, she did not really. She said, oh, you, you, you hijacked the plane for me. And the interpretation of that is that, oh, she was so shocked that the group would actually inter. But, and what they failed to understand is that, A, she was being modest. B, she was part of a collective. So she was saying, it's kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm an activist. I'm a member. I'm told to do what I'm supposed to do. So then they come and you say, they're do, you're doing this. Oh, and we, and she was so shocked. But actually part of it is that, as you know, Abir, and members of maybe who speak Arabic know, we always say, ana. we hate I. The people don't say, we always say we, even if it's an individual accomplishment, we use the collective we because it is part of, I mean, it's reflection of the a collective struggle. And it's also trying to under, understate and under, um, um, under, um, under, yeah, understate the, the, the role of the individual, which actually goes contrary to also colonial discourse that always want to construct exceptional. This woman is doing this because she's exceptional. This woman, and then we say, how many thousands and thousands and thousands of women do you need in order for you to say exceptional? So all of these courses are running. So I'm kind of like thinking about what are the discourses that are actually uh, being uh, constructed about us and what are the discourses and i'm saying about us and now i'm talking about you know palestinian arab muslim third world women of color indigenous women members of um, all members women and non-women women men non-binary members of in marginalized communities because you don't get to write your own history until you're victor the victor writes the history and the dominant powers write the history so all the descriptions that we hear in the media here today and we hear all the time Again and again, even sympathetic uh, accounts of what has happened, there is a spin on it that sometimes we say in our circles, a dead the only good Palestinian is dead Palestinian because maybe they can speak for themselves, so they can be constructed only as victims. So I want to talk about both. I want to talk about the repression that comes from different perspectives and the resistance that actually flips the colonial uh, intervention flips the the, the 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 neoliberal exploitation flips a gender gender hierarchy and patriarchy that exists and so on flips on its head and says okay this is what you're doing to, this is what resistance does and this is actually what has happened i mean in the case of many people but we're speaking about palestine in particular so to me it's sort of like an opportunity to actually deconstruct and when we talk about decolonial decolonizing knowledge, decolonizing our understanding of movements, decolonizing the struggle, decolonizing Palestine, and establishing a free Palestine, thinking about it not only as land per se, only, but actually the land and humanity. We're talking about something that actually we're constructed different imagined society. That is very different than what exists today on every single level. So we never talk about women's liberation I mean, people's liberation separate from women's liberation. We cannot talk about the free Palestine, just like Taliyad said, just like the Palestinian Feminist Collective recently said. I know you want, maybe you want to talk more about that. But also, like historically, Palestinian women and Palestinian serious movement, resistance movement, who are really serious about resistance, who are really serious about liberation, cannot speak about justice for in Palestine without speaking about all sorts of justice, or in other words, the indivisibility of justice. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. It was like everything I've been trying to articulate, but didn't know how. And actually, and I've been writing a lot, you know, you've been mentioning a lot of names and, and I'm writing them down because I've, I mean, I was, I've been studying and reading about Palestine for as long as I can remember. And I've never heard the name of like a couple of the names that you've mentioned, which I think just says something in itself, right? Is that 
um, we need to be reading more and writing more, right, about Palestinian women and the actual, like you're saying, mm -hmm. not this victim, you know, narrative, but the narrative that they want, you know, their stories to be mm -hmm. told by. And, and this kind of takes us into the next question I had. And this is something I personally, um, it took me a while to try to unpack and come to terms with and on a personal level, figure out this identity um, of, you know, defining decolonial feminism. So we've talked about, we've talked about it, but, but how do you define it? Um, and I have a couple of questions, like sub questions to that, but I guess the first one would be, how do you define it and how does it differ from white feminism? And how can we get, you know, more confident in distinguishing the two? And, you know, I don't identify as a, as a white feminist, right? And I feel like every time I, I have to explain my feminism, right? I have to explain that I'm not talking about white feminism and this is the feminism I'm talking about. And so how do you define it? Um, how do you make the distinction? Yeah. Okay, so uh, if you don't mind me, let me just uh, veer a little bit into sort of the academic field. So I know a lot of people say decolonial feminism. I prefer to say kind of like uh, um, um, feminisms and actually speak about indigenous women of color feminism. And this is, by the way, why our statement is called the, 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 the delegation that today is the first day actually marks the first day of the indigenous women of color feminist delegation. I, I just began to write a little bit about it. And one of the things that were actually really, really exciting about that is on that day, we were going, we were, we had arrived the day before and we were going to a place called Semenablis, which was a park. And then the, the, the person, Ala Abu Dher, who was from an Najah National University, uh, archivist, uh, director of the Dajil Youth Project, said, you know, nobody, not many people will come. Just prepare yourself. It's not just tell me the delegation. So I said, okay. So we go, and I was very excited because I'm from Nablus. I've never been to some Nablus because the closure of the Israeli military, you couldn't even go to the mountain and so on. So we get there, and there's over 40 people. And I'm going to only mention a couple of things that I think very exciting. We'll we'll continue. There's so much stuff, and we will talk about it more on June 23rd when we have the online event with all the members of the delegation who are going to be speaking. But I remember, of course, as always, we open up. The first person who to speak was Wazia Tawan, the indigenous woman on the delegation. She was still speaking her own language. And she then translated and says, my, my relations, I greet you, my relations. And she talks about it. And immediately, the president of the Arab Feminist, Arab Feminist Union, Tihad Nisa Al Arabi, which is a Palestinian in Nablus, Uhud Ya'ish, responds and says, I understand, I understand what you're saying. This is what's happening to us in Palestine. And there is this kind of like discussion. And another thing that has happened is that I've never heard it before. Angela Davis, in introducing herself, says, I've never heard this before since we've been talking about it. She says, what sustained me in 18 months in prison was a letter I received from Palestinian prisoners. And it was, I mean, it was, that, was the, that was in some analysis. That, that, some of these things happened. There is more that, that, that's going on. And if I got, I'll start talking about it, we will not end. But the reason I say indigenous are women of color feminist delegation, because I think the decolonial, in a sense, it's really great because it actually, this is first is to speak about feminisms, not one feminism. Secondly, to say decolonial, I think when you talk about decolonizing feminism, it's, it's different than when people say decolonial studies in the context of thinking anti-colonial because it's decolonial, decolonization was a big movement in the, I mean, it's still ongoing, of course, but it was raised by many uh, countries in the third world, in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, that demanded decolonization of colonial legacies. Again, that we cannot get into all of that, that requires another discussion, but that's actually, so when people say decolonial, I like that because I like it more than people say post-colonial, because post-colonial implies that colonialism has either when colonialism began, so everything is related to colonialism, colonialism at the center, instead of actually placing at the center of the analysis, the people themselves, their own stories, their own narratives, and so on, or that actually when colonialism is supposed to have ended. And we do know from all our studies that this is not the case. So I think this is, this is one aspect. The another aspect of it is I agree with you about thinking about decolonizing feminisms and the feminisms that is actually advocated by indigenous women of color, anti-colonial, anti-imperialist. Why do I say that? One is because also for our delegation, I don't think that the delegation would have happened or that the, the, the very famous, and we will speak about it a little bit later, National Women's Studies Association vote in 2015 in, in support of Palestine, affirming Palestine is a feminist issue, Palestine's issue of justice, affirming support for BDS would have never happened 
had NWSA not been what I call the browning of NWSA. I refer to it as the, that was actually led by some members of our delegation, including the president who was president at NWSA, Beverly Gishaftal at that time, who's also founded the Women's Studies a program at Spelman College, the first women's studies program at Spelman College, and actually marched in Selma. With, I mean, this is the his, this is the rich history that we have. But uh, uh, so that's that's really really important to think about. And the other thing, if we think about kind of like white feminism, and I think it's important, and I know we and you, we and I understand it, but I think it's important to explain it for the people who are joining us. Uh, white feminism is not about white people; it's about whiteness and white supremacy, and I think it's really important. And one example that we can talk about, again, because we want to actually basically like mention things and move on, is one of the major examples is the history of liberal feminism in the U.S. That the Seneca Falls Convention Declaration that is over 100 years ago when women uh, got the, 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 the suffrage right in the U.S. And it was started in New York, in upstate New York. Seneca refers to the Seneca tribe that was indigenous tribe. The women who actually started it were actually part of anti-slavery abolition conference in, in England and actually learned a lot of the, what they knew from the indigenous women, from the matriarchal societies. The problem is that it drops out of the narrative, so it doesn't get told. The other thing is that this, the, 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 one of the problems that we are actually against when we talk about decolonizing feminism is segmenting the struggle. So one of the problems that uh, B, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton did, which is everybody who takes intro to women's studies actually does it, whether you are a woman or not, if you're actually part of uh, an, a, a, an education that encourages liberal education, meaning you take all sorts of things and so on, you know that everybody will have to take a course or not. And if you're not learning about this, something is wrong okay, with that. But there was, there was another person who was very much involved in the discussion, Ida B. Wells who was one of the major organizers and was very, and then there was Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass actually said, organ, debated and, the, and, and, and the organized for the right of women and black people to be actually involved in the, in the right. The women's movement shows only, the, that leadership of the women shows only the women's right above black. Ida B. Wells was actually doing both and she was one of the leading organizers for the anti-lynching campaign against, and this was very prominent in the period, that there was lynching again and again and again of black black men in particular. And we just commemorated last week the Tulsa massacre of, of what people refer to as the black Wall Street that completely get erased. And again, it was quote unquote as a result of accusing of a black man of uh, sexually harassing a black woman, which what happened to Emmett T. Hill in 1955. And then the woman who testified against him reneged but he was already slaughtered. The young boy was slaughtered and was lynched and was mutilated. And his mom put his casket on display to show everybody the crime. So, but to get back to Ida B. Wills, she was criticized by the leaders of the women's movement because she was actually advocating for anti-lynching, not focusing only on women. So this is the, what differentiates what we call white feminism that only advocates for a particular segment of society and now we say to it white, but we also can talk about middle class or upper class. We can talk about Anglo. We can talk about U.S. We can talk about U.S. citizens. We can talk about against the indigeneity and so on. So it's kind of like it's a very exclusive, very exclusive kind of feminism. The last point I would say about that is that it also kind of like in, in tangent with um, what Betty Friedan, the book that she wrote, Feminine Mystique in the 50s, that actually argues that when women went to work, and women of color, indigenous women say, when women did not work, which is also relates to the Palestinian context and all our context that getting paid for work does not mean you work or you do not work. That should not be a criteria. You actually do a lot of labor that is thankless, that is free, that if it doesn't have monetary value, it doesn't mean that it's not work and it's not labor. And she's speaking about a particular group of women who were already educated, who become quote unquote what we might call today soccer moms, and then they decided to go to to go to, to pursue careers, at the, which is okay. But the problem is that it gets actually translated, and that's why we really need decolonizing feminism, and we need it in our own societies as well, in all the languages, not just in English, in all our because it's not actually it's not something that is known, and a lot of the stuff, for example, I mean, even when I was teaching. 
to, to their credit, the Institute for Women's Studies at Birzeit had actually translated so many writings by so many feminists. I mean, I was I was going there to teach in English, which was I learned, but then they asked me to teach in Arabic, and I really said, okay, I will I will learn with my students. So a lot of work by by, by indigenous and third world feminists was translated. But also a lot of studies, social sciences, quote Betty Friedan again and again and again, and say when women w went to work, and this is a huge insult for um, many people, but specifically indigenous or women of color, and including in the U.S., who have always worked. This is the same about you know Palestinian women and and and, and women around the world. It is an insult to to black women who were kidnapped and enslaved and worked every single day, day in and day out including having to produce more labor, slave labor, in order to enrich the, 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 the economy of, 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 of slavery. So I think it's kind of when people say, when the women get to, to, who are you talking about? So I think it's very important. It's not something that is only a theoretical concept. It's actually very in our own lives. And it also decides the value. It, it signals the value of the work you do, whether you're talking about labor actually as in doing a career or doing certain jobs and so on or even in uh, organization mobilization movement labor so I, I i i want to kind of like stay away from it um another thing we may talk about it another time which might we want to do something about islamophobia is what happened post 9 11 2001 and feminist majority and other colonial feminists which are advocated to try to quote unquote save afghan women from afghan community against river brown people and basically supported the, the interventionists and wars of the U.S. in Afghanistan, and which is something we can talk about a little later. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, and and they're very connected, right? And I yes. and um and my next question was, you know, why is the distinction important? But I think we got to it, and there's a comment in the chat, um, or in on from Facebook that says progressive except for Palestine, right? In white feminism, and that's been coming up a lot, especially this year. Of, you know, what this idea of why can we be pro progressive, but not when it comes to Palestine. And I actually think the, you know, the history and talking about the historical links of like indigenous, indigenous women in Palestine is really important. Cause I think at least from personal experience, when we bring it up and I always try to link Palestine as an indigenous issue and make those links, um, a, it's, a lot of people, a lot of times it's seen as a new thing, right? Like this is new that we're linking, you know, the two struggles or situating both the settler colonialism, right? But this is important that these links have actually, just like Black Palestinian or Afro-Arab, you know, solidarity, it's not new. There are peaks of it, right? But it's not new. I think the same, and, and less so we hear about the historical links of, you know, indigenous women and, and Palestinian women and, and those, um, yeah, those being interconnected. And it reminds me of the importance of intersectional feminism, right? Like yeah. in the last couple of years, we've been hearing a lot of like, if your feminism is, is it intersectional, I don't want it. And that's kind of what that what this conversation is reminding me about. Um, so I wanted to get, if there was anything more to add about why yeah. this distinction is important and and talk about the article, I, cause I, I just read it when you sent it to me and I loved it. The article that you published with Suzanne Adley, Angela Davis and Selma James. And anyway, what inspired you all to write it? And in that moment, why was it important to write? Yeah, let me just uh, say a couple of things about what you mentioned about the history of it. Because actually uh, like the American Indian movement was one of the first way, way back, not in 2012, 2010, 2011, in the, like when we have more social media, They've been already supporting and working on Palestine and supporting Palestine. And then I was I was fortunate to meet Madonna Thunderhawk, who was a standing rock, one of the main warrior women. And she was talking about back in the 60s. And then also uh, last uh, November, we commemorated the 50th anniversary of the New York Times statement that was published by Black Radicals. And we have throughout the year, we actually have done several events. Many of them are available online. Uh, well, fortunately, in other sites, because our Facebook page was shut down and we're trying to get it back. But one of the one of the speakers was Fran Beal. Fran Beal is was was with the SNCC, was actually a, a, a staffer for SNCC in the SNCC office in New York. When SNCC, when SNCC took the position on Palestine Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, committee and was actually denied all funding and was kicked out of their offices by the Zionist the landlord who was giving it to them for free. But Fran says that she learned about Palestine and she is the founder of the Third World Women's Alliance. So you're talking about somebody who actually has tons of history, a lot of history, 
right? And so she speaks about how she learned. She was a student in Paris and she was attending support for Algerians and she was connecting with people from Africa and as well. And this is how she learned about Palestine. So the connections that if you're speaking about what we call the living archives, People like Angela Davis, people like Beverly Gishifal, people like uh, Ingrid Washenawatak, who was with the American International Indian Treaty Council, who was killed uh, in, in Colombia. And she, and actually I met her uh, during a trip in Palestine, and she had met her partner, Palestinian, when they were both in Cuba. And her partner, Palestinian, was taken in Cuba after the 1982 Israeli invasion of Lebanon, the Sabra and Shatila massacre. And I mean, there is so many connections that we, it, it's just, it's, it's endless. So in terms of this article, the reason uh, we, we wrote it, actually it was organized by uh, um, um, our colleagues in the International Jewish Anti-Zionist Network. And what has happened is that there was a very big march called International Women's Strike. And it wasn't the Women's March. It wasn't the, the conventional Women's March that was organized to protest Trump win in 2016 and the, and the, and the loss of Hillary Clinton now we none of us is endorsing the sexist and and and, and really violent and uh, re nasty attacks by Trump and his company lock her up and whatever and so on uh, but we also uh, we we I mean it was good that people protested and there was a very big march and actually demanded and so on but the march actually did not raise all the issues including critique of Clinton that was actually that denied Palestinian Arab women support, uh, refused to support them when she was in Palestine, was a huge advocate of Zionism and APAC. And also, one of the things actually I think people don't really remember when we talk about Arab women, Samira Brahim, who was in the Algeria in the, in the Egyptian revolution, and she was actually the one of the first who spoke about the, 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 the abuses by SCAP, by the, by the military, Egyptian military, when they actually did quote unquote virginity inspection. And Samira got on YouTube and actually spoke about it. And so all the colonial feminists and so on hailed her because now she's speaking against her very oppressive sexist Arab society. But then Samira Ibrahim was, was invited to actually attend an event that was organized by the State Department under Hillary Clinton to honor women advocates and leaders. And then when Hillary Clinton found out that Samira Ibrahim supports Palestine and BDS, she was declined the invitation. The invitation was rescinded. That's colonial feminism. That's white feminism. So that's what happened is International Women's Strike is organizing this amazing and they put out a call and they talk about the connection of all the issues. They're talking about water rights. They're talking against the apartheid world. They're talking about the, the, the woman, the young woman who was at Columbia University fighting against sexual harassment and carrying her mattress where you know she was sexually harassed and she was given refuge at the students for justice in palestine they're, 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 they're talking about all of it so then this young zionist comes up and says oh palestine is not is there a place in feminism for for uh, for zionism and we said yeah in colonial zionism and white zionism and in white feminism and zionist feminism and so on of course but is that really is that really feminism that encompasses all or is that just Feminism is a few rights for the few that actually do not encompass everything. So we wanted to contest it. And there was also an attack on the National Women's Studies Association, where it was a very collective. And, you know, maybe another time we can talk about it. The way we came out to the BDS vote in 2015 in the conference in Milwaukee was actually a collective effort that had multiple work. And when we were at the conference in Puerto Rico in 2014, 800, 800 members signed a petition overnight to, to ask NWSA to take a position on Palestine right away. And then one of our, our members, uh, Chandra Mohanty, organized a panel with Angela Davis and other people who was on the delegation. The president of the NWSA, Trisha Lynn, stood up and said the people have spoken. The Puerto Rican women rose, held the Palestinian flag and said we are for, we're for Palestine. I mean, there was all of this stuff, multiple things, and there was a collective of us running around signing, getting signatures, getting people to do it. And it was really collective. So then this woman comes and attacks, and we felt we really needed to respond to that, to defend the international women's strike, and to actually say that there is no place, there is no place in real feminism, in an encompassing feminism for justice, for Zionists. There is no place. You cannot be a Zionist and be a feminist that actually addresses feminism for everybody, justice for all. You can actually be part of colonial feminism. Of course, all the power to you. Go. We don't want it. 
you can be part of uh, white feminism, you can be part of Islamophobic, but definitely not the inclusive, the international, the movement that includes everybody around the world, and it's 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 led by women about women's liberation, but it actually includes everybody, everybody includes because it's about justice, it's about gender and sexual justice. So that's why we actually wrote it in order to contest it. And I should just say, people know who Angela Davis is, but I want to give a shout out to Zan Adili, is actually a Jordanian uh, activist who is now the president of the National Lawyers Guild. She's been elected as president of the National, long, long time organizer, labor organizer, and um, um, organizer with Al Auda in New York. And also Selma James is actually the widow of CLR James, if people don't know their history, they need to know. But she's also a very uh, amazing, powerful activist who's in London, who's also part of the international anti-Zionist international uh, international anti-Zionist Jewish network, international Jewish anti-Zionist network. So she also has the feminist credentials. So this was actually really a, a pleasure and an honor. And and the the, the initiation was actually by Ajan to make this happen. So it was just. Uh, it was really necessary. It was a piece that that we worked on, we and and we were at, and it needed to be said. At the same time, there was also a Zionist group called Zioness that came out saying it's advocating for Zionist feminism, and this is very interesting. It's just like Zionists have have stolen the land of Palestine to establish a settler colonies. Zioness stole an image of a black woman in South Africa, and they made it their own. And it was exposed in Electronic Intifada, I believe, by Ali Abu Ni'ma. I mean, it's kind of like, I never gave them permission to use it. It's, it's, it's like unbelievable, the audacity of, I mean, but it's also, it has to do with colonialism. It has to do with repression. There is no morality and there is no ethics and there is no accountability in, in repressive uh, regimes and repressive structures. So. Yeah, that's what I would say. It's like, we're not, we're not surprised anymore, but it's, still like disappoint like it's still frustrating but it's like what else can we expect at this point and, and actually I, I smiled when you mentioned Chandra Mohanty because I read Feminism Without Borders I think it wasn't until I was in grad school that I read it and I felt like it's so extremely validated like it was just everything that, again like you know you're feeling it you feel like something's off in certain white feminist spaces or liberal feminist spaces but um, you you think it's just you and you know as well, there's always those moments of like is it just me right and I didn't necessarily you know, I wasn't always in Palestinian um, circles or Palestinian organized circles. So I always felt that. And when I read that book, it was just like, wow, this makes sense. It's not just me, like it's actually being written about. And so I, I wanna um, I wanna just put that out there too for anyone who might be listening of just how much that helped me process a lot of what we are talking about. Um, I'm just kind of keeping my I just wanna, that. I just want to give yeah. one reference because actually one of the early things I, I read before I was I, I met Chandra Mohanty, which was a long time ago. She she was just finishing grad school. At, about She said that one of the things that changed her was Sabra and Shatila massacre in 1982. Mm. But I've met uh, in the 80s in New York, and I actually one of the things that was translated in BZ was Under Western Eyes, which was an article oh. she wrote uh, mm -hmm. about the ways in which uh, uh, colonial structures, colonial uh, knowledge actually constructs and speaks about uh, women, including women who wear the hijab and so on and so forth. So that mm -hmm. was, that's actually translated and is taught okay. in, uh, in the, in the, the, in the curriculum of, in, of uh, Institute for Women's Studies. You know, we can talk about, I mean, all of them. I mean, the, the, the Gina Dent has been organizing, she's the head of the of the feminist studies at the UC Santa Cruz. And Melissa Garcia has been organizing day in and day out. And she's now teaching at Fordham University. I mentioned uh, Beverly, I mentioned Angela Davis, I mentioned uh, Wazia Tawan, uh, and again, Barbara Ransby was the president of the National Women's Studies Association when right after right uh, after we passed the vote, but she was also very much strong advocate and very active member of the delegation. Actually, we co-organized it together. Uh, um, uh, Ayunka Shinzara, who's not going to be with us on the, on the 23rd, but she was also kind of like she got up in Palestine and she was she held the handala and she wanted she said I want to speak somebody Palestinian gave me handala when we did a presentation <laughs> with the Palestinian uh, Anna Guevara is 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 a scholar of uh, Asian American studies at University of Illinois I mean there was this was sort of like the discussion with the Palestinian groups and the discussion among ourselves and what came after ten years after has had to do with the history 
with the production of knowledge before, with the history, with the living archives we're talking about, with the with the archives that are not written, that are not even like maybe people are living, but it's not even written, that people don't even know about it. You say you don't know about many of the Palestinian names. Many people don't even know about many of the people in the history because there is an intentional design to deprive us of learning about this. So when you go to school where you're supposed to actually be able to learn about that, whether you talk about college or we're talking about, for example, California, ethnic studies in the curriculum and so on, there is a very big battle by the Zionists and the white supremacists and their neoliberal allies. They're all together coming up, teaming up together in order for them to prevent this because they know a mind is very, very important and people can think and critique, create critical knowledge for themselves. So they want yeah. to block it. So yeah. that's why this is so, we, I mean, part of our agenda should be actually to, for ourselves to learn more, which is we're doing all the time, but also to make sure that this is also institutionalized in our curriculum. Yeah, and that's why I appreciate, you know, conversations like this, the, the non-academic necessary spaces, and it's more important for us to have these conversations in community spaces. Um, there is a comment from um, someone who's watching of if we can share and maybe type out the names of all the women organizers, the people you have mentioned. Um, I know oh, it might be a lot for can, right now, I but... Can, no, I can just, I'll just share the link. I'll just yes. share the link with you of the event that's coming up because they're on the list. And the, this, the statement is actually included so people can click on it. So I can share that and then you can share it with people. I mean, this is also, this is the, 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 the women who were able to go on the delegation. There have been many before and many after. So, the, but this was the first indigenous woman, actually the first indigenous woman of color feminist delegation. But I should say that we had another delegation in 1990 that we sent to Palestine. I say we, it was Union of Palestinian Women's Associations in North America. And it was mainly convened by the late Barbara Harlow. Uh, Ruthie Gilmore was, was on it. Uh, Alicia Partnoy, uh, and, uh, Angela Gilliam, Lisa Frank. There was a whole bunch of that they actually went to Palestine. And I know because at that time I met them at the airport and then we, and they've been speaking you know, ever since and so on. So there, there have been before, but this is the first indigenous woman of color feminist delegation. So we can actually say it is true that it is the first. So let me share the links about yeah. the statement and the yeah. coming up so people may want to join and share. Yeah. Yeah. If you can share them with me, yeah. I just put my email in the chat for everyone. Um, so feel free to email me if you're tuning in and want that and I'll make sure to share it um, once it's sent with me. And I, I think um, what I'd like us to, I did see also a comment in the chat when we were talking about post 9-11 Someone did mention, you know, the discussion of colonial feminism and post 9-11 era is extremely important to this day. You know, we continue to hear liberal feminists justify imperialist interventions by claiming that it will end the oppression of women. So this idea, right, that we need to go save the woman there, right? When, when meanwhile, they ignore the oppressive um, social relations that are created as neo-colonial regimes proposed up by West. Um, so I think, I think this is a conversation too that maybe um, we can continue. It's, gonna, it's a long conversation though, but it is one that is, definitely important. A lot of folks are um, are thinking about what I, and maybe tuning into this year, the, de the conference, the delegation will help actually with that. But I, what I do kind of want to take us into just keeping that on the time also, um, as we're having this conversation, and as we're talking about the importance of, you know, naming people right in the history and passing it down and make sure it's alive is what advice do you have for women who might be joining the movement or who are in the movement, any movement, right, for liberation and, and decol you know, decolonization? Um, what advice would you have for them in the movement or if they're new to joining the movement? Um, and maybe here we can talk about the the um, Palestinian Feminist Collective, actually, and, and how that, you know, came about and how people can join and, and be involved with that, too. Yeah, so I I, I I wouldn't say I have advice per se because I was organizing in my time. People are doing an amazing job today. And you mentioned the Palestinian Feminist Collective, which was an initiative that actually started with the Palestinian youth movement. It was women from, and I'm very happy to say that some of them actually were my students. They were amazing organizers and activists. They came up with, and it was, uh, the first statement was in response to Talat that was um, a group of Palestinian women in Palestine who were, were saying Palestine is a feminist issue. There is no, there, they said there is no, no, no national liberation without women's liberation. I'd like to say women's liberation is connected to national liberation in order not to say, but they were actually contesting uh, certain things. So this was the statement. And then uh, um, last, uh, this, this past, that past year, 
this year the um, the the collective which invited many of us to join in and participate and and some of us who are from kind of like OGs I would um, I'm okay I'm okay with that I mean I was I used to I used to kind of like say uh, and I say this all the time but I used to think that this means old guard but actually it means OG different some, one, some of my students told me about this I said okay I'll embrace it I'm happy to be one of the old timers and so on. But uh, they invited us because we were involved in the Union of Palestinian Women's Associations in North America. And this was part of the organizing here that we actually did in the 80s. And we, we, we were, you know, we did, it grew to 2000 members in 29 active chapters in the US and Canada. We did incredible things. We brought Palest former Palestinian prisoners and mothers of prisoners to speak in the US. We even had a press conference at the National Press Club. We did this family sponsorship program. We used to do events. I mean, it was, and part of it, by the way, somebody says colonial feminism, part of it had to do with the fact that we were trying to in, uh, participate in International Women's Day events in March. That was back in 1983 and so on. And then they, we were told, are you a feminist or a nationalist? And we didn't know what should, what should we say? I'm like, we don't even, the question was so weird because it goes back to my earliest, like, why do, why do you ask why women participate? Why don't you ask why men participate? Why do you take that for granted? That's not also taken for granted. Why do people participate and which people participate and which people don't participate and which people end up being tools and, and vehicles for colonial uh, projects? I mean, all of this stuff is there. So we said, okay, we're going to set up our own association. So we sat at the kitchen table in Brooklyn, I remember, and we created an association. We did this amazing event in Brooklyn. We did amazing event in New York, 500 people on each one. And that's that's our New York. But there was also an association in San Francisco from 1979 that women created. And we were, we were, we were dealing with all sorts of things. I mean, that's, that requires another thing. But so this is some of us who were organizing. It, it's I'm, like I'm actually writing some of these histories and do, working on it now. And so the Palestinian Feminist Collective come together and they invite, and, the, and the, the, the organizing, and there was a statement, Palestine is a feminist issue, that was published, it was, and then also there was also um, uh, recently when, when the, the attacks against Palestine, in Palestine escalated, a number of women came together and wrote this beautiful a love letter uh, to Palestine, and sort of like from us in the, in, in the Palestinian Feminist Collective, to people in Palestine. So it's kind of like we're part of the people, but we also recognize the specificity of we are where we're at and so on. And then the, the other thing I think it's really important is that this statement has been endorsed, has been circulated by many people. I also want to say that there has been amazing organizing recently also uh, by many uh, of our, I would say, sister comrades, uh, uh, colleagues who are who've been in it for a very long time. They organize these amazing statements by women and gender studies departments in various, including National Women's Studies Association, of course, in, 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 in solidarity with Palestine and in rejection of the colonialist, orientalist, Islamophobic, uh, um, um, uh, white supremacist discourses that are trying to actually dismiss the right of the Palestinian people to stay on their land, the right of Palestinian people to tell their truth, the right of Palestinian people to narratives, the right of Palestinian people to resist, this whole kind of like twisting things, which is, which takes us to what happened to, to you. I mean, this is that if you want to talk, we can talk about that. I have some things to say if you want, unless you want to go to other questions. No, we can, we can talk about it. I mean, I was, I think we've covered in some way or another most of the questions I had prepared and um, keeping an eye on the chat. I did just put, in case folks didn't really um, notice, I did put uh, links to what um, Dr. Ababa Mdahaji was mentioning before, and they're, they're, in, they're there, but you can also feel free to email me for more information about, you know, the Feminist Collective that we're talking about or other resources in general. Um, I have, there is another question actually, maybe before we get to that, I, there's a question that was just put in the chat. Um, why do Palestinians in Palestine allow the PA or PLO leadership to be more than 95% men? Imagine in all Palestinian universities who have more than 50% are, or who have more than 50% are women. Yeah, I think this is from, uh, is this from uh, Abuna Fahed Abu Akhel? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank yeah. you, Abuna, for joining. I mean, you're just an uh, amazing uh, resource for the community and so on. So, okay, so let me unpack that and say that compare uh, PLO leadership today and the Palestinian 
anti-colonial liberation movement in the past. And I would say, I mean, I actually, this, is, this was the topic of my PhD dissertation. I argued that the anti-colonial resistance movement enables, allows more space for what I call other than national identities to organize and struggle than what they call the post-colonial or the post-Oslo state. And the reason I argue, and part of the, my argument was actually two parts. One was is that the anti-colonial, it's, it's a movement. It's a movement that A, seeks to include everybody, and it's a movement for liberation. Palestinian women, like all members of Palestine, majority, let's say not all, majority of them, I want to always say majority, because not every Palestinian is participating. Members of the Palestinian society <coughs> are affected, whether they are affected in, in, in the areas occupied in 1967, whether affected by the areas occupied in 1948, and we see what's going on today, today, as we know what's happened with Akka, with Lid, with Haifa, with Umm al-Faham, with Nasr, with Naqab, everywhere else. Okay, we know what's happening to families in Jerusalem and Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan, and we kind of like honor the people who are there. We know what's happening to Palestinian refugees that are not allowed to return and what are the conditions of the refugee camps, because it was also supposed to be temporary. Actually, they were supposed to go home. It wasn't supposed to be permanent. Same thing as sort of like the Israeli conditions for 67, whatever. Every, but I, I, I always say that Zionism is a passing phenomenon. Believe me, Zionism is a passing phenomenon. And more and more Palestinians now are posting that, hey, my own mother is even older than your state. You know, my grandfather, this is the, the, the pave, and so on and so forth. So I think it is a passing phenomenon. It doesn't seem that way, but it is. But I, but there was in the national movement, there was always in the anti-colonial movement, there was always space to organize. The general, you know, Palestinian women in 1965 came out with a statement when it was formed, said the Palestinian is a person whose father or mother is a Palestinian, which actually contested the Palestinian National Council and changed it. So the Palestinian Declaration of Independence, despite the conditions under which it was adopted in 1988 in Algeria, which was accompanied by the political program that many of us did not really like, the, the Declaration of Palestinian Independence, and there are critiques about it as well, but actually it has a clause that says there is no discrimination on any basis whatsoever, including gender, right? And so this was a lot of space and women were organizing, everybody was organizing, women, workers. One of the, in, in the Intifada, the, uh, the, the Intifada of the Stone, the United, the Unified Women Council actually insisted and got International Women's Day as a paid holiday. And so it's made there. I mean, you're talking about in a context of a resistance movement, there are many possibilities to do so. Now, when you have something, Oslo, which is in itself a colonial structure, and when it creates a quasi-state, that is also a form of colonialism that many of us, I was always against Oslo, and I've been calling for the dismantlement of Oslo, as many people have, but not all at the time. A lot, some people were for two states or whatever at the time. Some of us were against it from the beginning. We always thought that it was, and we always did not feel that it was right. But what happened is after Oslo, some uh, participants, some people in the, in the movement became the GO, governmental, the whole movement was NGO and small N, small G, small O before 93. After that, some people GO. And then when you have that, and you actually try to act as a state without any sovereignty, without actually even, and I, I say it all the time, the, the Abu Mazen himself cannot travel from one place to the other without getting permission from Israel. I mean, cannot, cannot. So what kind of sovereignty you're talking about and so on. But at the same time, also the state, has actually instituted things that are very problematic in various PLC, and I attended many of them, actually. I attended uh, Palestinian Legislative Council meetings on the NGO law. Um, I was honored to go by with Marmar Barghouti, was one of the people who took me to. They said, come, you know, I wanted to talk to you. He said, come and attend. We're having a meeting and so on. I saw, and there is so much stuff, there is so much evidence to talk about that. The ways they, they, they created social law, the way they changed the Palestinian charter, the way they changed the Palestinian basic law, the constitution, the ways in which they instituted a lot of things that are about policing the boundaries, about actually the right and so on. It is not surprising that not only women are not represented, but who is represented? And I mean, with all due respect, who's represented the Palestinian in the Palestinian Authority government? And actually, even when they say Blinken is going to go speak about it, like why? 
why you're speaking to the Palestinian Authority. What does the Palestinian Authority really represent? With Again, with all due respect, and I don't want to undermine any because every faction has people who are fighting and organizing and so on. But two days, three days ago, we received, we saw a letter that is published by Minister of Interior, Palestinian Minister of Interior, saying that under no condition should Palestinian members of the, of the police and so on have any kind of attacks with the Israeli military. And the Palestinian, some of the Palestinian Authority uh, security have actually been engaging in arresting people who are resisting the occupation, putting them in prison. It is, it's all of it from beginning to end is a problematic. So I don't even, I don't want to talk about details, but I think this is not, this is not, this is not the rule that Palestinians fought for. This is not the representation. And I think this is a very big problem also for the PLO and the PA to be led by the same body. I think it's really a problem that the PLO passes the resolution and says, we need to stop all uh, security re uh, work with Israel and so on. And then the PA goes and reverses it. So if it does reverse, so where is the PLO at that? If the PLO Palestine Liberation Organization or the PLO another rubber stamp and a, a, a party and, and people who are in the PLO did not agree to that, the members of the Palestinian National Council, people who lost their families and their, their, their children to martyrdom, to prisonment and so on, and been expelled, been banished, did not sign up for that. So this is, doesn't really represent people. It's a very problematic body that has nothing to do with liberation, has nothing to do with freedom, has nothing even to do with rule or sovereignty. I mean, even if you want to talk about what are the basics of the state, it doesn't even have that. So I, to me, I, I, I salute every little child and every every older and younger and women from from the, the late on Nabil Kurt to her grandchildren, Muna and Muhammad in, in Sheikh Jarrah, to the people in Silwan, to Sheikh Kamal Al Khatib in, in, in uh, Akka, to the people who are fighting, uh, you know, Adala, to people fighting in Nakab. They are the ones, they are the ones that I follow. I follow the people who are resisting. I'm not going to follow this Palestinian Authority. And I really hope maybe some people will have a conscience enough to resign and dismantle this joke that is supposed to be about statehood that not does not nothing but advance the 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 the, the colonial um, ad objectives and allow the u.s to cover themselves and the fig leaf and say they're actually talking to the palestinians they're not talking to the palestinians they're talking to some people who do not represent anybody and again with my due respect so. yeah <laughs> well and i think and i think these you know sometimes we shy away from these conversations but i think this is the critical you know, dialogue and conversations that need to happen, even am internally, right? And amongst, as we're talking about liberation for Palestine, that can hopefully get us only closer to justice and liberation. Um, and I think, you know, and I, I'm just looking at the time and the I don't see any more comments. I do see an all power to the people comment and that I do want to make sure is said out loud because um, I agree. I think the people who are resisting on the ground are always the first that we have to honor and follow and, and, and talk to and learn from. I saw a comment from Abu Nafahed again. I, yeah, I, I actually have a lot of respect for Dr. Mustafa Barghouti and all the leaders who are actually have taken a very principled stand, not only mm -hmm. today, but also in 2008, 2009, when Gaza was bombed. And I'm talking now about the bombing of Gaza. Now. And I'm talking about the, 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 the also even the, the, like the, uh, Dr. Ahmad Tibi and others. I'm talking about the people who are organizing day in and day out. I'm talking about the hundreds of, of, of thousands of people who are, you know, there's over 1,500 people in Lidda who are in prison and so on. So I'm talking about all the, all the people who are struggling day in and day out. Yeah. At what we will have, I mean, it's just all movements go through this. And I just want to say one thing that I think it's really important for us to keep in mind that colonial powers have always plucked away our leaders mm -hmm. from the assassinations in, mm -hmm. in the 70s and 80s to the assassinations during the Aqsa Antifada and now to the price that's named on the head. I mean, let's not forget that. Nat Naftali Bennett, the person mm -hmm. who was made yesterday, start today, as the Prime Minister of Israel actually demanded assassination of Palestinian leaders. He's not only opposed to a Palestinian state and wants to in, uh, increase colonial colonial settlements on Palestinian land, but he also called for the assassination. And let's kind of like not 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 forget that all most of the people in this Israeli government have actually served in one time or another in intelligence, in military, in denying rights to Palestinian actually statements against Palestinians. Whether you talk about Palestinians in the 48 areas, 
and the ways it actually is constructed that actually the issue about Palestinians the 48 areas is to stop crime on crime Palestinians, which is a very racist statement. And we know that when it was raised in the election, actually Palestinians went with thousands of Palestinian flags everywhere and said that the Israeli police is responsible for spreading weapons because nobody has weapons. Yeah. Let's, 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 let's acknowledge it. And actually it's a known fact that nobody has weapons inside Israel with the eyes and the ears of the Israeli state and the, the shame bait and the multiple intelligence services and so on. Nobody can have weapons unless the Israeli state allows it. Okay, unless they're doing it clandestinely. But in public, the only people in Palestine, 48 areas who have weapons are sanctioned by the Israeli state. And there is a lot of weapons and they spread drug as well in order to actually turn the society against Israel because they're so afraid of the, 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 the spirit of resistance that's rising again. And we saw this in May 18th in the general strike. We saw this last week with the economic boycott. We're going to see it on Tuesday with the day of rage and so on. We're seeing it again and again and again. People are coming together. And this is the same thing in the West Bank. Who really has weapons in the West Bank? Honestly, who has weapons in the West Bank? The Palestinian security. There are how many? 17 agencies for security and so on. Who trained them? I mean, it was Dayton and, J and, and Jones of the United States who trained them in order for them to actually repress other Palestinians. It was very interesting because it was after Aqsa Intifada, they placed uh, the, the security in different places. So if you're from Nablus, they place you in Khalil or in, 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 in Ramallah or elsewhere. So you cannot, somebody cannot look at you and say, I know your mother. I know who you are. Shame them into stopping and so on. They trained them in the lang colonial language of naming Palestinian resistance as terrorism. And this is something that's been going on. There is a lot of studies by many of my colleagues that have done this again, and we can also, you know, provide this. We don't have enough time, but this is this is this is this is like I mean, it's astounding because it is very structured, it's very systemic. I always say it's anything but random. None of it is random. None of it is accidental. None of it is isolated. This is systemic, that has been done again and again and again in many colonial places and and, and by 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 repressive powers to remain in power. Yeah, and, and that conversation, because we got, I got a lot of questions too of like, oh, what do you think, you know, new person power? And it's like, it's under this, it's still under that same idea of like, it's not about the individual, right? It's about the system, the structure. So, and, and bring this back, you know, even talking about feminine, right, critiquing whiteness or the patriarchy that we're, we're always talking about and analyzing, critiquing structures and systems and institutions in place. And until that is changed, and we don't get real change. Um, and I think, you know, with that, yeah. and just keeping out of the time, yeah. I think that I, I was going to open up for concluding remarks and just, again, wanting to thank everyone who's tuned in and, and for you for joining us. Um, any last yeah. minute remarks? Yeah. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to leave it to you to have the concluding remarks because you should have the last word. You're the one who started it. So, mm -hmm. you, you, you know, this is, we always, when we do events and so on, we always actually make sure that, yeah, I like that. Actually, I appreciate that. I wanted to say one thing about uh, not. I don't want to go too much into discussion because that may be another time. But I think I wanted to say that the 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 the, the calls that you received and mm -hmm. the attacks against all of us, it is it has it is also there is something particular about it that's colonial, that's Islamophobic, that's Orientalist, and it's also very gender based too. Part of it is that, how dare you? How dare you speak up for yourself? How dare you articulate what you want? How dare you stand up and frame? How dare you speak your own truth? You're not allowed. And this is part of it is that you are too uppity. We're not going to allow that to happen. And I think it's really, really important to whenever they say that, whenever when, when that Shmuli put the ad in the New York Times against Bella Hadid and uh, Gigi Hadid and... Um, What's their cousins? Uh, the third uh, Palestinian. Hey, woman. There was an ad, you know, big ad about. It, it was also it, it also included things about you know gender and sex. And it, the, the, the calls that you received was about we're going to rape, and it was mm -hmm. something. This is a call, by the way, that was renewed in during 2014 by uh, Kider, who was a professor at Bar Ilan University. who said rape their mothers and 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 daughters. They said that. So there is this kind of like, but part of it is that we're going to teach you a lesson. How dare you stand up and act as if you're equal to us? Because part of the colonial racist discourse is that to kind of like construct 
this hierarchy, this supremacy. Zionism establishes a Jewish supremacy, but within that also, and it's the same way as like white supremacy establishes the white supremacy, settler colonialism, but actually not all whites are included in it. We know that, right? Some, some, some women whites, some queer whites, some, some poor whites, some homeless whites are not supposed to belong to the, to the what is supposed to be whiteness and so on, because this is supposed to be the land of the free and the home of the brave and the amazing democratic state, which is also the same discourse that Israel does about Jewish you know, supremacy. And it is actually part of it, inherently part of it, inherently part of it is what we might call apartheid structurally, because apartheid is a legal structure, but it is about inferior, considering the people who are oppressed as inferior are not equal to. Orientalism is the same way. When you cannot, you're not allowed. I mean, people say, well, who are you? You're, you're an Arab woman. You're a woman. Why are you actually daring to speak up? You're a nobody. You're not supposed to. You're supposed to speak only when you are allowed to speak. You're not supposed to. You have to. You Not only you have to raise your hand, you actually have to permission before. And maybe you will be allowed. Maybe you're not allowed. So if you stand up and you speak for yourself, crush comes up. Kind of like this is where the crushing and this is what the question you began with the intersecting systems of repression that come together in order. And then our awareness as people who are resisting of the need to construct and frame justice in indivisible terms and say, you know what? You can say whatever you want. This is how we're doing. We have to defend. We have to deconstruct and analyze. We also have to construct our own structures, our own strong bodies. We have to define things on our own terms. And we have to place at the center of analysis, at the center of our knowledge, the people whose voices are marginalized so they can speak their truth. So the narrative do not get erased. The narratives of resistance in Palestine and elsewhere do not get erased. And this is exactly what's going on now, which is why they're getting nastier. Bullies get bullier and nastier when they lose. They don't give up. They don't give up unless they're held accountable, which is why I would just say the last thing is that why we need to advocate for boycott divestment sanctions, at the very least, to hold Israel accountable. We need to hold ourselves and our own communities accountable. We expect better of ourselves. We deserve better. We deserve, because we're fighting for freedom. We're fighting for justice. We're fighting for dignity and humanity. We deserve better for us and for everybody else. We do not do the practices that the people who oppress us do. We do not. We do not seek. We do not go. We do not uh, exchange. Uh, insults and so on. We do not say you racist things. We come together and we have a different future and future will be ours. We will. It's just a question of how we can reduce the casualties. How can we reduce the sacrifices so we can achieve our freedom sooner rather than later and achieve and it will be by extension it's going to be peace and freedom for everybody, not only for, for Palestine and for us. <laughs> Yeah, agreed. Yeah. I don't know how, how better to end it on a note than that, but definitely I think that is that is the very least agreed of, of what we can be doing. And and to kind of talk about the calls, you know, a lot of the interviews or news were like, and you guys still stayed open the next day or you were still open for the week. And we did have that conversation, but at the end, you know, and I think this speaks to what we've been talking about is, you know, we're not going anywhere, right? And part of the point is to intimidate and to scare and to stop the work that we're doing. And instead, actually, it, you know, it gave us this. Um, so I think that's the best way to end, right? Was was that happening, you know, connected us and then it created this conversation, which is only going to to hopefully get us closer to that step of liberation and, and the road to, to justice. Um, and with that, I just want to thank everyone who's tuned in. I want to thank you again, Dr. Abdel Hadi, just for, every, for this conversation, for all the work you do, um, for myself, for other women who have been inspired and just kind of get that extra... You know, we're not alone from reading your work and, and hearing you and all your work. So thank you again. And thank you to everyone who joined. Um, please continue to follow our center on social media, subscribe to our mailing list for future events. For We have a lot of resource guides that we've been putting out. Um, hopefully this is not the last event we do with Dr. Abdel Hadi either. So keep an eye out for future things that we might collaborate on, especially um, in keeping this conversation about decolonial feminism or anti-colonial feminism and indigeneity and the role of women in all our movement. Um, so thank you all and have a great night.